essentially want to move on to how do we deal with, how do we look at and understand these systems when they're not so ideal, they don't have this constant relative volatility for our systems. And in fact, the worst case scenario for us in terms of distillation, they have azeotropes in. Okay? So today, what I want to go through is to essentially have a, just have a little reminder, refresh your memory about what azeotropes are and how azeotropes can form. Then, we'll get out everyone's favourite, some ternary diagrams, and see how we can start representing these azeotrope systems, but now not just for two components, for three components, how we start to think about systems like that. And then we'll move on to these two concepts here called residue curves and distillation curves. And we'll move on to see their use, how we can use these things. So these are things that allow us to actually look at what's happening in our distillation columns. Okay, and how we can think about what separations we can make with our distillation columns. So hopefully from a couple of weeks ago, you can remember that if we've got our non-ideal Routes law system, yep, so we end up with our fugacity and our Y, I, our vapor phase fraction times our total pressure is essentially equal to our activity coefficient times our liquid fraction times our saturated vapor pressure. And what we mainly did was said this is ideal, so we can reduce the fugacity and the activi activity coefficient to 1. But this time what we're going to do is say, well, we're still going to operate at relatively moderate pressures, so we can reduce our fugacity to 1. But let's let's think about our non-ideal system, so we still keep our activity coefficient in our Routes law equation. Okay? And what that means is not only do we have these non-ideal systems, but these non-ideal systems can commonly manifest these azeotropes. Okay? And what we tend to have is when we have fairly close boiling systems of very non-ideal mixtures of different chemical types, that's when we tend to get azeotropes. And of course, the classic one that we've been discussing several times, water and ethanol, when we put them together, we, we get an azeotrope in our vapor-liquid equilibrium for that system. So, of course, the problem we have is that at our azeotrope, our vapor and liquid compositions are identical. And because our vapor liquid compositions are identical, all of the, every single component in our system, our K value is 1 at that point, and our dew point and our bubble point temperatures are also the same, which essentially means we can't separate those by distillation at that step. So our alpha, our relative volatility, therefore, is equal to 1, so no separation can take place. Okay? And we can find the values of our azeotropes by actually solving Routes law here, our non-ideal Routes law, for where our value of x and our value of y are constant, uh, sorry, are the same at the same value, and of course we get, zero, we get 0 and 1, which is pure each component, but we also get a third point, which is our azeotrope in our system. Okay? So we can get different types of azeotropes. Okay? So the first type we can get is what's called a maximum boiling azeotrope. And we get a maximum boiling azeotrope where our activity coefficient is less than 1. Okay? 
So you might remember from before that when we have an activity coefficient less than 1, what that actually means is that when we mix our two components together, that those components actually prefer to be mixed together than being separate. Okay? So that means when we mix those components together, we have to actually heat those components to a higher temperature to get them to boil when they're mixed compared to when they're pure components. Okay? So what we end up with is a T XY diagram like this, where essentially our azeotrope, which is the point where they meet, or more familiarly for you guys on an, in an XY diagram, the azeotrope where it crosses our y equals x line, but our azeotrope boiling point is higher than the boiling point of either of the pure components. Okay, so it's simply called a maximum boiling azeotrope. The next type we can have <coughs> is a minimum boiling azeotrope, right? So in this case, it's a converse argument. So in this case, our activity coefficient is greater than 1. And what that means is, is when we mix our two components together, they prefer to be separate than mixed together. Yep. So that means that to boil them, we actually need to, we don't need to go to as high a temperature, we can go to a lower temperature and they'll boil. So if we look at our azeotrope here, you can see that the the boiling point of that azeotrope is lower than either of our two pure components. Okay? That makes sense so far? Yep, you remember that from previously. Excellent. So, <clears throat> these two different types of azeotropes that I've just mentioned are what are called homogeneous azeotropes. And that's because what we have is we have a one vapor phase and one liquid phase. And they're in equilibrium with each other. Okay? But if we've got a very, very large deviation from Routes law, or our activity coefficient is much, much larger than one, then what happens is <clears throat> Essentially, we may get phase splitting. So, if you remember back to liquid-liquid extraction, if our two liquids, when we mix them together, really, really didn't like each other, so very high activity coefficients or very different solubility parameters, they would separate into two liquid phases. So, in this case, what we can end up having is that we can have those two liquid phases actually in equilibrium with one vapor phase at our heterogeneous azeotrope. Okay? So, if we just think about that, so this is our system for an activity coefficient a bit greater than one, and we may have a liquid, liquid separation region, and we've got our vapor-liquid equilibria separately up here at a much higher temperature. But what happens as we start to increase that activity coefficient is as we increase the activity coefficient, our liquid-liquid separation region gets larger, gets larger and, it, and wider, and it also starts to exist at a higher temperature. And the other effect that happens is that our vapor liquid equilibria, our azeotrope, our minimum boiling azeotrope for our vapor liquid equilibria starts to exist at a lower temperature. And at a critical point, essentially our vapor liquid equilibria collides with our liquid liquid equilibria. And what we get is at this point here, which is our heterogeneous azeotrope, we have our vapor phase that's actually in equilibrium with two liquid phases. 
Okay? So if we look at that in the same style as we did for the minimum and maximum azeotropes, then what you can see is we get a very similar pattern, apart from we get this grey region, and this grey region is essentially where our liquid-liquid separation happens. So there's essentially three key regions on this. So the first one is on is on your left-hand side of this figure over here. So we have a liquid composition in equilibrium with a vapor composition at our boiling point temperature. Or we can represent that with the dot on there. On the other side of our gray region, on the other side of our azeotrope, we could essentially have a vapor in equilibrium with our liquid point, represented like this. And then, at our azeotrope, what we have is we essentially have our vapor composition, the red point here, in equilibrium with our two liquid phase compositions. Okay? <clears throat> so, as I said, when we've got, we've got azeotropes, then we can have problems with distillation. So, back in the first lecture of the year, I posed the question about how do we separate, can we separate ethanol and water with distillation? And we were like, yes, but if we want it more pure than our, that more pure than our azeotrope, then we've got problems with just a simple distillation column. So, this is our ethanol water system. And it looks like this, and we've got our azeotrope composition about here. And if this is our feed, which we talked about 10% from lecture one, of course, if we do a standard sort of distillation, then we can step down and get essentially our pure water. But when we start to step up towards ethanol, we get restricted by our azeotrope, so our, our non-pure ethanol. Okay? So this part of the course is first of all going to see how the issue with azeotropes and distillation and how we can see what separations are possible and then we're going to look at some solutions to how we can get round the azeotrope problem by using our distillation separations. So the interesting thing about azeotropes is that it is possible to shift them or move them or break them because there is some sensitivity to the pressure of the system. Okay? So for example, say we've got our ethanol and water at essentially atmospheric pressure, it's about 95.6 weight percent of alcohol where our ethanol is, as where our azeotrope is. But if we are able to get to a very low, very low pressure, or almost a vacuum, then actually no azeotrope is formed in an ethanol water system. Okay? But it's up to us to decide to say, well, is that, is that, is that feasible to then actually afford to be able to reduce everything to that amount of vacuum or do we want to find some of the ways to look at that okay and one of the key ways to do that is to think about adding another component into our mixture that will not only affect our uh, our, uh, our vapor liquid equilibria but will also allow us to do uh, more than one distillation, so we can look at two distillations or more in a sequence to try and get around that azeotrope, and that's what we're coming on to. But first, we just need to see how we can actually represent those systems. And of course, the advantage there of having that, that third component is we can potentially achieve a separation, but the disadvantage for us is it's now a more complex system. So if we've got a ternary mixture, 
our equilibrium compositions don't lie on a single, a single line, so that x, y line isn't a single line. We have an additional degree of freedom. So we've got essentially three components, two phases, two, so we've got three degrees of freedom rather than just two. So we need to know other information about our system to determine where we are at equilibrium. Okay? And we'll see that as we start to look at how we can think about these systems. So, of course, the first thing is how do we try and represent uh, our vapor-liquid equilibria on a ternary graph? Okay, so this is essentially the standard method that was developed to do that. So, what we've got is, like we had with liquid-liquid extraction, we've got our ternary axis and our grid lines in grey. Yep and that represents our liquid phase composition. And then you can see on top here, we've got these non-dash lines and these dash lines. So these non-dash lines here are representing the vapor composition of oxygen, and these dash lines are representing the vapor composition of argon. So what we simply do is look on this graph at a particular liquid phase, and then we can read off our vapor phase composition. Okay? I said simply a lot during that on purpose. As you can see, it's not particularly a nice method to do. And now if you think about, we also need to start drawing potentially extra material on top of that graph as well and we've already filled it full of lines. So, in reality, even though this is what we can use, especially when we think about we would need one of these diagrams for every single pressure that we were thinking about working at as well. Okay? And we would also need extra information to tell us what the temperature of the system is as well. So, in reality, this kind of system is rarely used. And what we just do is we tend to just work in the liquid phase compositions. So we have our ternary graph, and we do all our work in the liquid phase compositions. And then if we need knowledge of the vapor phase composition, we would just do a calculation for the point where we need the, va me, where we need the vapor phase composition. Okay. So when we're trying to develop our feasible systems, so we just look at our liquid phase composition. So it makes it a lot more simple for us to do. And it's therefore very, very similar to what we were doing with the liquid liquid extraction back in before reading week. <coughs> So what we can see here is we can see how we will represent some of our more simple azeotropic systems on our ternary diagram. So these are all for three components, A, B, and C. Okay. So our first case is very, very simple. So our first case is a zeotropic system or a system where there are no azeotropes. Okay. And in this case, we just have our standard ternary phase diagram. Okay? So we can look at our liquid compositions on that. Our middle case here, what we have in this case is we have a system where our components A and B form an azeotrope together, but component C doesn't form an azeotrope with any of our other components. So what this means is we only have a single point azeotrope and we can just plot that point as essentially a dot on our diagram and then we may want to label, say, the temperature of that azeotrope. 
but this is how we would represent a single point azeotrope on our system. And then in our third case here, we end up with two azeotropes, and what we have is one azeotrope that forms between our A and our B components, one azeotrope that forms between our B and C components, and then our A and C don't form an azeotrope. So what we end up with is one azeotrope on our A and B, one azeotrope on our B to C, and then in this case, what we also have, which adds more complexity to the system, and we'll come on to look at in more detail in a bit, is we have these azeotropes that are essentially joined by what's called a distillation boundary. And this is essentially joining two azeotropes together. And just like in a two-component system where we can't pass an azeotrope, in our multi-component system, we can't pass a distillation boundary. Yep, so if, we, what, if we've got a feed in region one and we just have distillation columns, we're essentially stuck in region one. And if we're in region two, we're essentially stuck in region two. So if you're in region one, you can't get pure B out of your distillation sequencing. Okay, without, without doing something else, you can't just use simple distillation columns. Okay, so does that make sense? Yep. So what we can do now is have a look at how we actually start to put our distillation sequences on, on these ternary diagrams. Okay. So... Let's start here. We've got our, so we've got our three components, A, B, and C. A is our most volatile component. C is our least volatile component. And B is our intermediate. So first of all, we can get our direct, direct sequence out, where we separate them in, in order of decreasing volatility. So in our first column, we separate A, and have a bottom product of B and C, and then we separate B and C. So if we look at our ternary diagram, we've got our feed here. So in our first column, we're separating A from B and C. So we've got pure A as our top product, and B plus C there as our bottom product. Okay, And we're representing the separation across the column with a straight line. Okay? So remember back to liquid-liquid extraction, a straight line, right, on our ternary diagram, the mass balance. So that's all we've done in this situation. So what goes in is our feed, and what comes out is our top product, which is our pure A, and our bottom product, which is a mix of B and C. So all this is, is a mass balance across our distillation column. Yep. So any distillation column we have, we can represent on a ternary diagram by a straight line, where one end of the line is our top product, one end of the line is our bottom product, and somewhere in the middle of that line is our feed position. Okay? So our first column here we can represent with this red line. Then we've got our B and C. And then we know that we split our B and our C in our second column. So we can represent, oops, we can represent our second column as this blue mass balance line on our diagram. Okay? So we know, because of our last week's lecture, that for this type of system there's two options. Yeah? There's our direct and there's our indirect sequence. So we can also do the same with our indirect sequence, where we specify and we split essentially our C off to leave A and B, and then we then separate our A from B with our blue mass balance line. Okay? So that's just representing these lines on here. <coughs> 
Of course, theoretically, there's a third option, which is to get B out of our first column, which, it, which we could represent by this red line here. But we know that it's impossible to separate an intermediate boiler out of a distillation column, leaving our as a two components as our as a product. We know that's impossible. Okay? And in fact, as we come on to seeing how we can represent these systems at the end of the day, we'll see how we can actually calculate and work that out without just using our knowledge that we can't separate an intermediate component. So we can't do this separation, we just have the previous two, the direct and indirect. <coughs> So if we move on now to our slightly more complicated system, so we still have our three components. We know that the two that are possible are the direct sequence and the indirect sequence. But in this case, instead of having our nice zeotropic system, we have our system that has an azeotrope between A and B. So we've got our azeotrope between A and B here. So if we again start to draw our sequences, so we've got our direct sequence, so we can draw our nice A separating B and C together, and then our second column separating C from B. So that looks good. And we can also look at our indirect one, and in this case, we draw our first column on, C separating A and B, looks great. Then we go to draw our second column on, and we now find we have our azeotrope in the way. Okay, so because we can't pass that azeotrope, we can't separate B, uh, we can't separate A from B using our simple distillation column. So we immediately are able to find out that we can rule out our indirect sequence as a possibility in this case. Okay? And then, of course, we can also think about the same when we've got our distillation boundary. And, of course, this case is a big problem because we can't cross this boundary at all. So if we've got a feed in this region here, the only pure components we can get are pure A and pure C, no matter what sequence we do. Okay, we're always going to end up not being able to get pure B. Okay? So as I was saying when we were looking at these, we were able to do that yeah, because we used our, our knowledge that we can't separate the intermediate component and that we can't, sep we can't pass azeotropes or distillation boundaries, okay? But these were very simple, very simple systems. If we've got much more complicated systems, so for instance, if we have a ternary system, it is theoretically possible to have four azeotropes in a ternary component system, okay? One azeotrope between compo A and B, one azeotrope between B and C, one azeotrope between A and C, and one azeotrope that consists of A, B, and C all mixed together. And it's also possible that all those azeotropes are connected with distil distillation boundaries. Okay? So that's an incredibly complicated looking system. So we can't just apply, we can't just go, oh, well, that's the intermediate, so we cannot separate that. We need a more rigorous method to be able to work out how to do it. Okay? And what we can use to do that is what's called residue curves. Okay? And our residue curve describes the change of the composition of a liquid phase of our mixture during essentially a continuous evaporation. Okay? So previously, I would have had to have said think back to last year, but now think back to probably a week, couple of weeks ago, we've got a mixture that's continuously evaporated, 
Oh, it's a batch distillation. Yep. So, in this case, our residue curve, we're just thinking of a very simple batch distillation system. Okay, so we've got no trays, no packing, no reflux. Yeah, so really simple batch distillation system. So we can do a mass balance on our batch distillation system. So we can do a total mass balance. So our mass balance is the rate of the change of our amount in our still with time is equal to the amount of vapor that is leaving our system. Yep. And we can also have a mass balance for each of our components in our system. So our total mass of our component, so our liquid fraction times our total mass, is equal to the total mass of that component that's actually leaving our system. Okay? So just a simple mass balance for our batch distillation column here. Our component balance we can expand. So we can say that our differential of Wx dt is our dw dt x and our w dx dt. So just a standard expansion of those two variables. And we can also combine our total mass balance into this expression here, which we can rearrange. And what we end up getting is our essential rate of change of our liquid fraction of component I is our vapor fraction of component I minus our liquid fraction of component I and then this term here which involves the rate of removal of our liquid in our system, our total mass of system or essentially what we can kind of think of as the heating rate to our system. Okay. So this is just the rearrangement of our simple mass balance. So what we can do is now is a little mathematical trick. So instead of working about time, because we're not actually, in this case, we're not trying to work out how long it takes for our system to, to evaporate or to distill in our batch distillation system. What we're actually interested in is how the composition changes in our still, okay? Because that's what our residue curve is. So we can define this expression here, which we can just call a dimensionless time, okay? And we can define this so that it's a function of our mass of our still with time. And what we can do is we can substitute this expression in to our derived mass balance to pull this dimensionless time out. So the rate of change of our x with our dimensionless time is just equal to the difference between our liquid and vapor compositions. Okay? So that's our key batch distillation equation when we've got no reflux and no trays. We, of course, also know for all of our systems that the total of all the, the fractions in the liquid phase must add up to one. We also know, because we've got vapor-liquid equilibria, that we can link these together with our k-value or our Routes law expression. And we also know that our sum of our y fractions must also add up to 1. Yeah, because our total number of either molar or mass composition must add up to 1. Yep. So what we can do is we can use these four equations here. <coughs> 
and actually solve these equations to generate our residue curves. Okay? So in this case, we've obviously got a differential equation. But what we can do is we can apply a numerical solution to that differential equation. Yep. Instead of integrating it, we can just have a numerical solution. And we can solve this and get our residue curves. And what we need to do is we start from a position on our graph and we expand these equations around that position and that feed will produce one residue curve. Then each of our feed positions or our original start positions will then contribute a different residue curve to our system. So we can obviously do this experimentally as well, which is just collecting essentially the composition with time and then that line would also be a residue curve. So we can do it computationally or we can do it experimentally. And what it starts to look like is we start to get a graph like this. So if we were to take this point here as our arbitrary feed point and we calculate our equations, what happens is, is we start to move along this line in this direction here. Okay? And as we're integrating our expression, we're essentially increasing our dimensionless time. And because that's essentially meaning that more and more liquid is evaporating, it acts like we're increasing the temperature. And the arrows point in this direction. Okay? So as you can imagine, if we really wanted to do this, for our system and get lots of these residue curves so we can work out what our system looks like, it will take a very long time. But programs like Aspen have functions like this built into them. So you can go on Aspen and you can actually ask Aspen to produce residue curve diagrams for you where it does all of these calculations. So as I mentioned, our residue curves represents the change in the residue composition with time for a simple one-stage batch distillation column. Yep. So if we think all about our, the methods we can use for distillation and the reflux ratios, so we've got our sort of one-stage batch distillation with no, uh, with no reflux. Might be, if this is our whole spectrum, might be over here somewhere. Okay. So is that really representative of a continuous multi-stage distillation column with a reflux ratio? Yep. So an alternative might be to think, well, maybe we can look at another extreme. So instead of having like our batch, sort of one stage, no reflux, well, let's think, well, what's, what's right at the other end of our spectrum? So, essentially, over this side at the other end here is a multi-stage distillation column with 100% reflux. Yep. And then all our realistic distillation columns that we use would lie somewhere in the middle. So if we think about this system, so we've got our multi-stage infinite reflux ratio, then we could look at this, and it's very, it's very similar to our derivation of the fancy equation. And what we get, instead of having our rate of change of our liquid composition with our dimensionless time, and then our equilibrium, what we end up with is we end up with these two expressions instead. So this is our operating line for our continuous system with infinite reflux ratio, and this essentially is our equilibrium equations. Yep. So what we could also do is, like the example question in the handbook, you could also do the same calculation, but using 
these expressions to generate what is called a distillation curve. Okay? But the real importance of this is, as I've said, so our, our real column is somewhere around here. But we've got our residue curves sort of on that side of our spectrum and our distillation curves on that side of our spectrum. So actually, if they kind of give us the same answer, we're probably quite happy that they're a relatively good approximation to what's really happening in our distillation column. And this is what we can actually see. So our dashed lines are our distillation curves. So that's our total reflux, continuous column. And our solid lines are our residue curves. So no reflux, one stage batch. And you can actually see that really, based on, how our, based on the approximation of these methods anyway, that the dashed lines and the solid lines are pretty much very similar. So our real distillation column would essentially be somewhere in between the extremes given by these two lines. Okay? So you'd be quite happy to take either one of those as our approximation for our real distillation column. And convention, we normally take a residue curve to be that approximation. Okay? So at the start of today, when we were when we were talking about the feasible separations and that we knew that we couldn't separate our intermediate product, I said that we'd see the method to actually be able to work out all our feasible products using our residue curves. Because when we've got azeotropes and we may have much more complex azeotrope systems, it's not always obvious where our feasible products are. So our residue curves can allow us to make those preliminary investigations. And we can determine these regions based on that column material balance that I was talking about, that straight line, top product, bottom product, straight line on our ternary diagram. Okay. So it's our straight line that connects our distillate and our bottom product. And that line must pass through our feed composition at some intermediate point. Okay? Now, that's our one criteria for our feasible product. Our second that we're now adding on to is based on our residue curve. And because our residue curve is representing the equilibrium separation that's happening stage by stage in our distillation column, what it means is, is that essentially the ends of that line, the, the distillate and the bottom product of our column, must also lie on the same residue curve. Okay? So we've now got two criteria for what a realistic feasible column looks like on our ternary diagram. Yep. Bottom product, feed, top product all lie on the same straight line, and the bottom product and the top product must lie on the same residue curve. So if this is our example system here, so if we've got a feed on our diagram, so we've got our feed, so we can define uh, a distillate that we want. So what we know is we've got a distillate which we've got specified. We've got our feed. So we've got one criteria that says that our distillate and our bottom product lie on the same residue curve. So we're identifying that residue curve that the distillate lies on to be this now blue line. So we therefore know that because the distillate, feed, and our bottom product must lie on the same straight line, we can immediately draw a straight line to define where our bottom product must be, 
because that's where that straight line intercepts with that residue curve. Okay? So we can now start to identify what, uh, what mass balance and what uh, products we can get from our distillation columns, now not just identified from us remembering things like, oh, we can't have the intermediate product uh, as a product because it's in the intermediate, but now based on actually knowledge of the vapor-liquid equilibria of our system. Okay? And of course, we can repeat this for any, any type of system. So we've got the same feed, but potentially we would want a distillate now that has none of our component H in it. So in this case, it now happens to be on this residue curve line here. So a straight line then means that we now have this bottom product instead of our previous bottom product. Okay. So, of course, for a given feed, what we could do is we could repeat this process for every potential distillate and every potential bottom product. And what that gives us is it, it will give us an area on our ternary diagram where it's feasible to produce a product. Okay? So that will immediately identify to us where we could actually have a distillation column and what type of products we can get from that column. So instead of just essentially repeating this for every single possible distillate and bottoms we can think of, we can start to think about this in terms of an area. So the first thing we can do is take our feed. Okay, and then from our feed point, we can, if we don't have one there already, we can estimate what the residue curve would look like that passes through our feed point. Okay, so in this case, we've just approximated it to follow the same pattern as the residue curves either side of our feed. Now, what this has done is identified the two extreme endpoints of this residue curve that we can potentially have. And for this feed, it's our L and our H. Okay? And by the way, if you've not already spotted the notation in this, our light component our intermediate component and our heavy component, L, I, and H. Okay? So in this case, it's immediately identified our light component and our heavy component okay? as the extreme ends of that residue curve. So that means technically we could have a distillate or a bottom product that lies on that residue curve. So if we have a bottom product that lies on this residue curve, the most extreme one is our heavy component. So from our most extreme, least extremely separated bottom product, we can draw a mass balance line for our column. So that passes for our bottom product through our feed and basically continues until we hit a boundary for our ternary diagram, and in this case that boundary is our, is our bottom axis here, okay? We can also do exactly the same for our most extreme top product. So that would be our light key, or our lowest boiling component, through our feed and then until we reach the limit of our ternary diagram, okay? So now from this, what we want to do is work out, so what, pro what are the feasible separations we can make, okay? And we can do that by thinking, well, this is our residue curve, 
through our feed, and this is our extreme line here, so we can actually go between this line and our extreme line from our distillate to get everything that is a potential bottom product for that feed. And then we can do the same, so we can go, this is our extreme bottom product, so therefore this line here is the line that limits our distillate product, and we're also limited by our residue curve, so we can define that this bottom region here is all the potential um, distillate products. And these two green regions here are the only points on our ternary diagram where it's possible to satisfy both of our criteria at the same time. Okay? So the criteria that the bottom product, the feed, and the distillate must lie on a straight line, and the bottom product and the distillate must lie on the same residue curve. Okay? Only points in those two, two green areas can satisfy that criteria. Okay? So you can see based on this feed what we can actually potentially get out of a simple distillation column. Okay? Does that make sense? Yep. Um, so the, 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 two, the points within these two green regions, they satisfy the, the two criteria that we said we needed for a column to be possible. The first criteria being that the bottom product, the feed, and the distillate all lie on the same straight line. And the second criteria being that the distillate and the bottom product lie on the same residue curve. Okay? So only points within those two green regions allow both of those criteria to be satisfied. Okay? And if we think back, because this is our system that actually has no azeotropes, so we can see, and of course what we would expect for such a system, the intermediate component is not available as a potential top or bottom product. Yep. So although when we started we just took that as our knowledge that that wasn't possible, using these residue curves and using this method has actually showed us that it's not a feasible product. Okay? So I say these green areas are the only feasible product regions that we can get from that particular feed. And because of their shape, they're often called bow tie regions. Okay? Now, the strength of this method comes when we move to slightly more complicated or to more complicated systems. So if we have a ternary diagram like this, okay, so what we have here is we've got one azeotrope that forms between n-octane and two ethoxyl ethanol, and one azeotrope that forms between ethyl benzene and two ethoxyl ethanol. And then those two azeotropes form a distillation boundary between them. Okay? So what we've got now is a much more complicated system that we could never work out from our knowledge so we have to think about our bow tie regions to do this. But the method is exactly the same for these more complicated systems as it was for the simple sort of zeotropic example. So if we start with F1 as our example feed, then we follow the same step. So we identify, we identify the residue curve that passes between F1 uh, and then, in this case, you can see it goes to a pure component, but also that azeotrope. Okay? Then the same process again. 
So we go from our extreme end, in this case our extreme bottom product, through our feed to determine our distillate line, and then also from our extreme distillate through our feed to get our extreme bottom product line. Okay, so that's exactly the same processes. Now, the difference is in this case, as I said when we were doing the zeotropic system, we stopped our line because we got to the end of our diagram. In this case, we stop our line because we get to our distillation boundary, which we know we can't cross. Okay? So instead of going all the way over here, we're now stopped by our distillation boundary. And then we can do the next same part of our process. So we've got our distillate limit line to our residue curve to define our bottom product. And here we've got our bottom product limit line to our residue curve to define our top product. Okay, so again we get a very similar style bow tie region around the feed, but we've identified what it's like within this limited region because of this distillation boundary. Okay, and it doesn't matter if our residue curves are these simple curves or our residue curves are a more complicated shape, like they are for our F2 here, we still follow exactly the same process. So our feed, identify the residue curve that passes through our feed, that identifies our two extreme products, our extreme distillate, our extreme bottom product. We then go from our extreme bottom product through our feed as far as we can. And of course, we stop if we're limited by our distillation boundary or limited by the outside of our graph. And we also draw a straight line from our extreme distillate point through our feed and again till we stopped or limited by our graph. Okay? And then, exactly, we did, even though this time the residue curve is a much more complicated shape. We still take the limit from the line that we took from our distillate that defines our extreme bottom product between there and our residue curve. And then in this case, we've got our extreme bottom product here. So we follow that line up, which is so our extreme distillate product is here and our residue curve. So therefore our feasible area is this whole region for our distillate. Okay? So these are really powerful because they show us what our feasible products are for our systems. And it doesn't matter how complicated our ternary phase diagram is. Okay? It doesn't matter. It's still exactly the same process that we follow. And that allows us to identify what distillation column we can actually make and what products are available from our distillation separation. For instance, this is a good example here for F2 because we've got pure N octane, we've got one azeotrope, we've got two azeotropes, and we've got pure ethyl benzene available in that region. So we wouldn't know what we were able to get as pure, or we wouldn't know what we were able to get out of our column. But looking at our feasible regions has identified that it would be possible to get pure ethyl benzene out of the column, but it's actually not possible to get with just one simple column N octane. We would have to settle for something around the azeotrope composition instead. Okay. So what we've done today is had a recap around azeotropes and then we've thought about how we can look at these for the ternary systems. Okay? 
And then what we've moved on to, and the most important part, is we've looked at how we can calculate residue curves. And then at the end there, we've looked at how we can make use of those residue curves to actually work out what separations we can actually undertake from particular feed points. Okay? So next week, what we'll do is we'll move on to, first of all, a method to calculate approximate residue curves and to work out where distillation boundaries form within our system. So instead of having to do all the long calculations, there's a method that we can do to help approximate where the distillation boundaries are and approximate our residue curves. And then we'll start to look at some of the methods we have that we can actually use now to start to separate these azeotropic systems.